So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Jean-Baptiste, and he's going to come. Um, I'm, I'm going to let him just talk a little bit about um, himself, but he it lives in, um, I hope I can pronounce this correctly, Chatelion Plage. Right. Not plague. Yeah. Chatelion Plage. Yeah, even though the plagues are coming. And yeah, it's a, a wonderful uh, seaside uh, village on the Atlantic coast of France. It's that part of La Rochelle. It's just, you can look it up on Google and you'll just be envious of where God has placed him. As a, he's a pastor and a missionary who came to faith in Christ here in Southern California. Yes. Uh, through the ministry of the, of the vineyard, indirectly, right? The Valley Vineyard. Right. And I know you're going to share a little bit more about that. Right. So everybody, let's receive Jean with a, a, a warm hand. Is this working? Uh, hello. I think it is, yeah. You'll have to project because I'm not sure whether that projects your voice or does it. Is that okay? All right. Good to be here in Monrovia. Um, I'm in the United States to visit uh, five or six children who live here, who are born here. We uh, have been living in France for 21 years, and I have a ministry uh, planting a church in France, as well as uh, to French-speaking Africa, and uh, before that, about 10 years to the country of Haiti, where I traveled from Florida. Um, I uh, am going to talk to you today about uh, being a disciple, about being changed by Jesus, I'm going to talk about being on mission with Jesus and then reproducing life, the life of Jesus. In order to do that, I'm going to read for you the verse of the uh, Apostle Matthew in chapter 28, verse 20. I'll start with 18. Jesus came up. And spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always until the end of the age. So my first question to you, when Jesus says, I am with you, is that you? <laughs> is that you? Yes. Was it the apostles? Was that you for them? But is that you in Monrovia today? So is the Holy Spirit here? You've been waiting on the Lord. Is the Holy Spirit here speaking to you today? Is Jesus speaking to you today? Are you willing to receive my words, the words of Scripture, as the words of Jesus for you Amen. today? Amen. And that's what Jesus meant. It's not a coincidence that He's brought you out here today. He's brought you to hear from Him. I first heard the Gospel on a, at Pepperdine. I was going to school there in Malibu. I had a required class. I was in the business school. The class was called Jesus the Christ. And we studied the parallel Gospels. And you had to study because there were exams. And if you didn't make at least a C, you can get to the next class. And uh, that's also where I met my wife. And one day she invited me to hear a preacher named Jack Hifford. And there was a sunrise service. We were on some bleachers. I think it was 1976 or 77. And uh, I was on top of the bleachers. I didn't want to get too close. So I was on top of the bleachers. And I had my blue jacket, corduroy, and red tie, and white shirt. And at the end of the preaching, I, mean, I was really moved by the Holy Spirit. And he went, you know, I think there is someone up there. Your heart is saying that your legs should be going down, but you're stuck. <laughs> and I was crying inside, but I didn't want to show it. And I think I was moved. I think that day, maybe the Holy Spirit moved into my heart 
to take residence. Then um, I worked selling real estate investments downtown Los Angeles, and uh, I had a business career. And uh, my wife one day said, there is a Bible uh, study at such and such house. And I wanted to meet that man because he was the wealthiest man in town. And knowing him would have made me a lot of money. <laughs> so I went over there and we sat, he's in the Pacific Palisades, white leather couches, seeing Palos Verdes on the left, Malibu on the right, absolutely gorgeous. And I just keep trying to talk to him and I was chain smoking. And I, <laughs> and Ah, hi, okay, yeah, hey, hey. and then I call him, and he calls me back, he comes back and forth, and then there goes the guy, he said, Jean, <laughs> so there comes a guy walking in with a cross, no and have you heard about someone named Arthur Blessed? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so he walks in, and he puts his cross right in front of me, and he sits next to me, and he puts his arm around me like this, wow. and he tells me, are you a Christian? I says, yes, I am. And uh, I said, I, I, my uncle is a Catholic priest. I went to Rome with him. I kissed the Pope's ring. <laughs> came back. By the way, they have real good ice cream over there at the Vatican. And uh, he said, yeah, you've kissed the, Pope ring, but the Pope's ring, but do you, he sits up, looks at me like this. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? So I thought, he's nuts. <laughs> he's crazy. But he gave me a book called A Walk with a Cross, which really spoke to me. And the thing is that he told me that he had given his Porsche away to start his ministry. And he impressed me as someone who really separated himself from the world, like a John the Baptist. And from that time on, from Jack Efforts preaching, from that time on, up to 1983, in between, I attended vineyard churches in Los Angeles, like in 77, 78. They were in the Beverly Hills area. And then at the Valley Vineyard. And then finally, I was baptized on February 1st, 1983, at the Valley Vineyard for those of you who knew some of these churches, his name was Bill Dwyer. And it was in the days when you've heard of Keith Green. Keith Green was in that church. So I was, I was in the midst of a, I didn't know that, but now I realize that there was like a substantial visitation of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in, in those days, in, that, in those places. And as soon as I uh, got baptized, uh, I was discipled one-on-one -on -one by various people who took the time to mostly listen to me. They taught, but they listened. And they found out what I was about. Now, after that, in my business career, I spent a 18-month period making absolutely no money. I had made a lot of money for eight years, and all of a sudden, I make no money. And my boss Comes, calls me in his office, it's downtown, Bank of America building, and he says, hey, uh, I want to tell you something. I've always thought of you as a movie actor. When they tell you that in L.A. in those days, it means that they're going to fire you. <laughs> Real soon. So, and he says, I think we're going to review your budget in about a month. <laughs> that means you got a month to make a deal. So I went to the bathroom, knelt down, and prayed, Lord, help me. I'm going to be fired. This is my reputation. I am done. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to be an embarrassment. And... Uh, when I nailed down, you know where bathrooms are in, in, oops, in um, public buildings in L.A.? They, they don't go all the way down. So when I nailed down, I realized before getting up 
I saw his shoes, my boss's shoes. And then, yeah, yeah. But I only had... The, the, he could recognize my shoes because they were French, uh, uh, like a orangey, brown kind of shoes, very fancy, very unique. So I knew that he saw my shoes and that I knew that he saw it was me <laughs> praying. So he must have thought that if he's praying, not being a believer, he must be desperate. <laughs> so anyway, right 10 minutes later, when I got out of the bathroom, there was a message on my desk from someone who, make a long story short, who bought a building for which I was a broker in 25 days. The Monday morning, I had a check to bring to the office for 153000 It was the Monday morning I was to be fired. And I put, I had a Bible, and I put the check in a passage of, I didn't mean to do that, I put it at John 21. John 21. And uh, I looked here, I just started reading because it was quarter six, I still had 15 minutes to go into the office until it opened. And it says, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And I said, but how much is my check? So I get the envelope. I had put it right in there, right in, in this page. By the way, it was this Bible. And I opened it up. The check was... Hundred and fifty three thousand. Wow. <laughs> I had a Cadillac, I looked above like this, and maybe God is no, no, no. God is here. He surrounded me. He's got his hand on my wallet. <laughs> there were three things that were really important for me in life in those days. First was money. Two was money, and three was money. That's the God of Los Angeles. Not as powerful here, maybe in Monrovia, but over there, it's money, money, and money. A couple of years later, I got involved in ministry, Bible classes. Uh, I got involved in the uh, weekly Bible meeting prayer, ministry, and then they got me involved in the healing ministry team. I wanted to see if it worked. And uh, first time, they told me, look, uh, you just lay hands on people, and they'll get healed. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll try that. And that same friend who invited me in Pacific Valley says, I told him, you know, if you got people to heal, just send them over. <laughs> and he says, sure. <laughs> the guy calls me on a Sunday morning. He says, Sunday night for your service, I'm going to send you someone who has a severe knee problem. And he's going to be wearing a cast. And he's going to be coming over. I says, sure, send him over. <laughs> he says, wow, what am I going to do? So we're the two of us. The guy gets there, and that was at the Valley Vineyard, we lay hands on him. The next day, he calls my friend, he's totally healed. Completely healed. I don't know what he was. He was totally healed of a knee injury, like a past knee injury. So now, I want to be involved, it's called healing teams. So I went to get the training. For, for three years, I got training, and they would send us to Anaheim. Some of you knew Anaheim Vineyard with Wimber. So I went to be trained over there. On Sunday nights, in the bus like this, that's all I would talk about. But before that, you know, I was on my way to other places, but then now I'm going to Anaheim. Why Anaheim? This is like boondocks. <laughs> you know, go to Anaheim to be trained. And it was amazing because just the presence of the Holy Spirit praying for people. Just amazing. A visitation of God. Just real plain. Plain. 
So then I started taking ministry trips with some of the pastors. And once I went with a, a fellow named Jack Little to San Jose, California. And he asked me to go and help him plant a church in Florida. I said, I'll go check it out. When I went over there, I met some Haitian people who spoke French better than me. <laughs> this is amazing. So I decided to move to Florida to start a mission to the Haitian boat people and help Jack plant the vineyard wow. in South Florida. So I moved over there with my family and three children. And then three were born over there. Now I want to tell you about, after telling you about being a disciple, I want to tell you about being changed because God, whoever has the Holy Spirit, is always sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Those who are not means, in my view, that they have never received the Holy Spirit. You know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God that is at work with you to will and to do. So the Holy Spirit works in you. Um, I remember getting to Florida, we attended a marriage seminar, and I was able to make a new commitment to my wife. I had a very fresh discovery of the qualities of my wife, which I didn't see before, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, one of the main values that I had, as I told you, was money and owning things. I bought a house for 550000 in a place called Whispering Woods in Coral Springs. I put down about 200000 Had Still had some money then. And uh, I was not making any more money. So I got behind on the mortgage, and I asked my friend here, whom I knew, who was very wealthy, who had become friends now, the Christian, could you come and... Uh, buy the house for me, and I'm going to wait at least six months to see if I can either uh, make some money or arrange the house to sell it. And he says, no problem. So he made a deal, arranged for a transaction, and the day that he arranged with the bank to do the transfer, the bank said, it's too late. And we, it was a fraud, but we couldn't do anything about it. And he got defrauded too. What we, what we did here, we knew it was happened Friday, and on Saturday morning, we were told to move out of the house. We had to move, the whole church moved the entire furniture of the house into storage. I went to live with three different people. One house was only cement. They were under renovation. We put some carpets, and we had the kids in there. My wife grew up in Pacific Palisades and Brentwood. This was not fun for her. <laughs> My wife never wants to go back to Florida. <laughs> it was a gorgeous home on an acre. Beautiful house. So I lost <coughs> this asset. And uh, it was very difficult to do this. And, uh, but I better understood when I had a ministry to the Haitian people who, like me then, had nothing. And I believe God made me poor so as to minister to the poor and understand them what it is like to be poor because of my calling. So, um, but you know, I'm staying at my son's house. By the way, God has provided all things for, for me since then. I've always had a place to stay. And uh, we now live in a beautiful place. I don't own it, but I'm there. <laughs> I, I eat and sleep every morning there. And it's nicer than where the place I lost. <laughs> You've been there, right? <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, I'm trying to be careful now with... Uh, uh, the way I say this with uh, children here. Um, I had a relationship before I was married with who uh, was uh, married. 
and uh, so I uh, was receiving prayer about 10 years later by a sister in the Lord. She says, I can see the name, the words, forgiven. But then she put the name of this person. And she told me the name of the person. Wow. It's been 10 years since I became a Christian. I did not know that I was forgiven. I still had a culpability, a guilt, because of what I had done. And I wasn't sure that God had forgiven me, deep inside. The week after, I went from Florida to California, the Anaheim Vineyard, and I got in, and at the entrance, there was a sign about this big. Someone had drawn a painting, and the painting was Jesus holding someone like this, and underneath, it said, forgiven. But what happened was that the face of the guy was my face. I have chills when I think about it. It was my face. Forgiven. So my former lifestyle, before I knew my wife, you know, my, the lifestyle I had, you can imagine a Frenchman, uh, my lifestyle, entirely Forgiven. In Greek, the city Telestai, in John 19.30, Jesus said to Telestai, and that means it was a term that was used to put a stamp on all bills that were paid. I'm talking about all bills. So there is no, if you're forgiven, there is no bill There is nothing that you have committed, you have committed 10 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 5 years ago, 5 minutes ago. That is not under his blood. He has forgiven everything. Everything gets forgiven. And everything will be forgiven for the one whose spirit is dwelling until his death. You don't have to worry. His spirit is dwelling in you. And he has forgiven you. I, uh, so then I had this mission for five years to the poor in Pompano Beach. And then I started traveling to Haiti after five years each month. And I traveled each month for ten years. Preaching campaigns in the country of Haiti. Um, at the same time, I attended two seminaries, one night school at Moody Bible Institute, and then day school at a seminary called Knox Seminary. It's important for those of you who want to serve God to do that. John Calvin wrote to 1,000 pastors in France, and he told them, send me wood, and I send you back some arrows. Prepare people for ministry. And those were some of the most wonderful times I've had. But one day when I was in uh, Haiti, a seminary professor had heard of my work over there, wanted to see it. And uh, there was a woman giving a testimony of, a, of herself being raised from the dead. And uh, when we got back to the hotel, he told me, do you believe her? I says, I don't know her from Adam. <laughs> but I have no reason to believe that it did not happen. There were 40 people with her who all say that she was dead. And now she's come back after 45 minutes. So what can I say? And if you want to check, she works, she works in the United States at uh, Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital. You can go talk to her. He says, you know, you need to take a break. When I got back at seminary, he got the faculty together and he asked them, he told them that I need to take a break. They wrote to my main supporter, this is on Facebook, they wrote to my main supporter, whose main name I won't mention, someone who's very prominent, and he was supporting me substantially and asked him to not support me. So I lost support from all the contacts I had 
there for about three or four years, four years. And so I was there with no money and no support. What I want to say is that there is a cost of commitment. There was a cost for my house, and now there is a cost on income. If you don't want, if you don't want to compromise, there is a cost. If you believe in signs, wonders, and miracles, in France today, they say, well, that was, you know, Saint Benoit, Saint Gregory, or Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, but, you know, Paul. No, but here now, yeah, you're a quack. <laughs> you're a cook. You know, but what does the word say here? Make disciples of the nation, teaching them all that I observed you. That, and this is, it was a great thing for me to, and many others, to walk into this ministry of John Wimber to be able to see this thing being done by the book. Very simply. You just believe it. It says it, just do it. But there is a cost to it. We need to take a cross and follow him. So I was invited to Africa and I was able to saw converts like never before, more than Haiti, bigger crowds. So I decided to meet, I'm sorry, I decided to move to, Af to, I'm sorry, to France so as to travel to Africa in French-speaking nations because you cannot do it from here, from, from, from New York. So um, it's an amazing thing to walk into a Holy Spirit move of harvesting people. In other words, you come out from Paris, you, at the airport, they have those uh, half-naked ladies, Christian Dior and Chanel and all that, you know? And you come out of the airport, you get into the plane and you come out, it's like people, people turning to God. <laughs> it's a shock. And it's a shock going the other way. <laughs> you know, that's how it is. Hope we won't get a lawsuit from uh, Chanel. <laughs> But you have to follow him because if you love God, we talked about loving God, if you love him, you know, Elijah loved God. Before he knew he was going to go up to heaven, you had Elisha. He says, no, 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 I'll follow you. I'll follow you. And Elijah would say, no, no, stay here, stay here, stay here, stay here. No, 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 I'll follow you, I'll follow you. They both love God. But Elijah wanted to have a funeral going up to heaven in front of no one. He wanted no one on this funeral. Zero. Because he loved God and he was humble. He wanted to go up by himself. Who cares? He had no fear of man. Do you have fear of man? Do we have fear of man? And we must not. We must be like Elijah. No fear. What are you going to gain if you have fear? What are you going to do about it when you go in your coffin? You're going to say, oh, I'm sorry I had fear. <laughs> it's too late. It's too late. The time to not have any fear of man, whoever it is, is now. And now in Monrovia. I'm not sure how I am on time. Whenever I go up a platform in uh, those uh, campaigns in, in Africa, I repeat the words of Paul. And uh, to me, the very least of all saints, it has been granted me to preach the infallible riches of Christ. And I do so many meetings that I don't know what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> I'm, I'm climbing the stages and I have no clue what I'm going to say. But when, I, when, when you're there, you take a passage of Scripture and the Holy Spirit enlightens every word. Wow. Every word. I just One comes to my mind is, which is easier? Your sins are forgiven 
or rise up and walk. So I got someone, a sick person to the right, <laughs> rise up and walk, and the person is healed. But I didn't plan on it. I didn't plan on the scripture. Everything happens. The Holy Spirit invades the meetings. But you have to be in the place. You have to be in this cloud. And the cloud of glory has to come. We must have it. So I exhort you who you are praying here, that it doesn't matter how many you are, okay? Uh, the uh, Moravians were three people. They were praying every day. And all of a sudden, at a specific date, Count Zinzendorf says, at that time, that day, the Holy Spirit came. And from there was a revival that spread out all over the world. Without being presumptuous, uh, no, you cannot be presumptuous, but at the same time, you should not underestimate what God can do with you and your prayers. Because God is alive. Amen. He's alive. Yeah. And He hears you. He is near to your words. And His ears are attentive to your cry. And you say, oh, well, why would He do something in Monrovia? Even in our church, Why? And then, what would the Holy Spirit tell you? Well, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> why would He send you a John the Baptist? <laughs> I had asthma in Africa one day. The thing is that, it was on a Friday, there was a, I had a pastor's meeting, and a pastor's wife said, you're going to have asthma next week. You're going to have trouble breathing. But when you get to France, when you get back, you fast three days, and you'll be healed. So I went to the pastor's house, and said, do you know this woman? <laughs> she said, yeah, yeah, well, is she right? He says, yeah, she's right. <laughs> this is no good. <laughs> in, those, in June, in, in Kinshasa, there is a thick layer of dust from the roads. There are many roads that are not uh, asphalted. And also, they burn trash because there is no uh, central trash. So I, I, I breathed a lot of that. So that's how I, I got asthma. But in any event, Monday morning comes... <gasps> I have a hard time breathing. Monday afternoon comes. I sent someone who's helping me. And uh, Micah, he went to preach for me, the campaign, the second campaign we were preaching. And I went to the, see the doctor, and he gave me a shot here, cortisone, and then the nurse gave me a shot here, but she missed the van, and he went all around. So the next day, I went back to preach, but I was like this. <laughs> that preaching, when I was barely out of voice with a mic, was probably one of the most powerful preaching whereby God used me. In weakness we're strong. Elisha was dead, buried. And the marauding band came, was buried on top of his body, and they got up and were raised from the dead. So we're used. God uses us in weakness, in deadness. And one of my great weakness was my strength. Too much strength. So just like this, remember the $153,000 and the 153 fishes for Peter? Uh, it was a miracle of God for him to catch the fish, but it was a miracle of God for him at Pentecost to see this harvest of souls. Because Jesus had told him, had told him, tend my sheep. Peter was an evangelist. So he had, he saw a harvest that was a miracle. I saw harvests that were miracles. Just as it was a miracle for me to make that commission. The harvest itself is a miracle. Being born from above, a man 
Jesus tells Nicodemus, unless a man is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In order to see, he has to have God's spirit. Otherwise, he cannot see. This is how it works. So, now... A couple more things to tell you. I was wondering why God gave so many poor people in Africa to uh, the harvest while so few in France. And I remember seeing a video after asking God, I saw a video of masons working in Florida in a city called Margate. And they, there was a big hole, hole they had dug, and there were three guys in it. The first guy got out when the hole collapsed. The second guy was pulled by the first guy, and then there was a guy caught with a big stone on his side. And then he wanted to pull, he was screaming, pain. He was blocked by, he was caught by that stone. And he took... 75 people to get that person out from 3 o'clock in the afternoon until 2 o'clock in the morning. And the last guy who worked with it was with an electronic uh, power bit. And they had carpenters holding the stone and so forth. Uh, they had newsmen, they had nurses, doctors with IVs and so forth. 75 total. And then the thing turned off. And I felt the Holy Spirit was telling me, who are you if I want to use 75 preachers to save one man in France? And what if you are that one man? <laughs> Should I let you go? We must be thankful to carry a tray. To do what God asks us to do. Jeremiah had a ministry amidst apostasy with no repentance. You might have a ministry with very little repentance and a lot of apostasy. I believe we're coming in the days where we ha are we having a lot of opposition to our ministry. And uh, Jeremiah was persecuted because of his faithful preaching. So if you're faithful, you're going to be persecuted. So you better be ready for that. Now, I want to tell you that don't be worried. The Lord is going to provide all things to you. I was thinking I was coming out of Brooklyn. I had to go preach in Pittsburgh. And I needed a carry-on. And I said, you know what? I don't have my wallet. Where do I get it? Where do, how do I do this? I'm going to ask my daughter, where do I go buy a carry-on? And I turned around. There was a carry-on, a gray carry-on. It said free. <laughs> <laughs> so, I said, so I just took it. I said, Papa, don't, get, don't take the carry-on. I'll clean it with some... Some bleach. I just clean. It's great. Someone gave it away. So God provides. I was just thinking about it. I didn't ask God. I was just thinking about it. <laughs> now, I, one thing I want to tell you is that the end of all things may be near. I'm not an apocalyptic cult preacher. Uh, I want to say that his return uh, is going to be real. We don't think about that. It's going to be real. He's going to pierce through the screen. Amen. Pierce through. The return of Jesus. Second thing is that it's going to be sudden. Sudden. 
is going to be the end of all world history. You know they have those things, the passages of one bill and one bill. We're going to meet again in September 21st. Or you look at your agenda. Uh, we have a meeting for Tuesday afternoon, 3.30 p.m. And the Lord returns at 2.20 on Monday. And what you have on the agenda is not going to happen. And there are all sorts of things that are planned, are going to be planned, and so forth, that people are expecting to do. And the world is not going to know. But God is going to come to take His people. And there will be a people for God. Because He says it. It's going to be a real event in world history. And today we are starting to we talk about this and that and this nuclear thing and that and that. We're trying to, many people are trying to pinpoint to signals which are not really necessary. The main thing to know is that it's real. It happens. And it's sudden. I was recording a video. You know, you wonder what are the unbelievers going to say when the Lord returns. I was recording a video in our backyard. Uh, YouTube, my son produces them. And I asked the question, what are, going, uh, what are the heathen, the people who don't believe, going to say when Jesus actually appears? And there was, my neighbor was working with some tool. And he was not able to do what he was intending to do. And so I asked that question, what are they going to say when he appears? And my neighbor said, Mad. <laughs> Which, excuse me, the term. <laughs> excuse my French. <laughs> you know, he says, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. I'm saying it so that you might remember that the heathen, the unbelievers, they are going to say there is nothing else they can say. But yeah. What can you say? Let's go to the Morovia Vineyard over there. Did you meet that guy there? It's over. It's finished. You could say that, but after that, you say it again. You say, <laughs> so you keep saying, as they say so often today. Around me, I hear it on the west side over there. <laughs> That's what I believe they're going to be saying. Because it's too late. We haven't done what we're supposed to do. So because it is the case, we believers today need to grasp the moment. We need to realize that he's going to pierce through the screen. And it's going to be sudden. And that there's going to be difficult times in between today and the time of his return. But persevere. If you're a disciple, lastly, as I said before, there is a cost of commitment, there is devotion, there is perseverance. Uh, there is a, a willingness to be changed and reproducing yourself unto others, training others. But also you will discover Jesus and love him more and more. By the way, I, heard, I was at the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir two weeks ago and it was Jim Simbala was saying, you know, people say, a lot of Christians now, they say, God, you know, we should say Jesus. <laughs> <coughs> because we're embarrassed to say Jesus, so we say God, because God means anything today. He means anything. He can be interpreted as meaning anything. But Jesus is Jesus. I liked his comment. So anyway, um, I really appreciate your hosting me here today. 
It's a nice break from being on Los Angeles West Side in Santa Monica with my uh, two boys and their families. And uh, I'm glad I came. I enjoy listening to uh, Kathy with worship, uh, sharing the Lord's Supper with you. And uh, I will be praying for you, and we will pray in our church for you and for your church that God might do his will. And uh, so that's, that's it. I, uh, um, when I was meeting over there, I uh, felt that there was like a... Uh, a prophetic gifting for the lady with the mask over there. This this lady here. And uh, so I just sense that. And for you, I sense that, uh, you know, like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they were walking. And it's not, they could not see that Jesus was with them until he uncovered, he showed himself to them. And I believe the Holy Spirit wanted to tell you that, Jesus is walking with you, that he's with you, and that you don't need to look about, and that he's with you. So. So. I'm in a vineyard here now. It's different. I was with Presbyterian who wanted gifts of his Holy Spirit, so now I don't know how to adopt you. <laughs> you know, I was in Pittsburgh, Presbyterians who want gifts of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. <laughs> what? A plan? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, is there someone who does need prayer that uh, for particular anything particular that I could pray for? You do? Yeah, I need. Okay. You want us to pray for you afterwards? We can yeah. talk about it afterwards. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll do that. So. But I'm trying to see if the Holy Spirit wants to tell something to this congregation. And uh, I, I do think that it is, it is this. That Jeremiah's ministry was conducted in the midst of apostasy without repentance even though there's some saved, but in general, his ministry was conducted in the midst of apostasy, without repentance, outside of the remnant. There was a remnant. And to be faithful, to persevere and be persecuted for your faithful preaching. I felt those uh, words uh, might be for your church here and for you.